is Fendi, and I am a naturalist for the City of Aurora's Open Space and Natural Resources Division. I am so excited to have you, your teachers, your friends and family all here today to learn about some of the wildlife that we have here in Aurora and their adaptations during this Discovering Aurora's True Nature virtual series. With many of us having to stay indoors, these videos will help us learn and discover about some of the fascinating, mysterious, and wondrous marvels of the natural world. Before we get started, I do want to let you know that there are a few questions that I would love for you to answer before resuming this video. These questions may have been given to you by your teachers, and if not, you can find the questions in the description box below. Please pause the video, look over these questions, answer them, discuss them the best you can, and then resume the video when you're done answering. Today, we are going to be learning about a couple of the ecosystems that can be found here in Aurora, as well as some of the adaptations of the plants and animals that live in them. At the end, we're going to have some really fun post uh, questions and some activities that you can do at home. So, let's go ahead and get started. Plants and animals have adaptations. Who can tell me what an adaptation is? Adaptations are tools that plants and animals have to survive and thrive in their specific environment. Adaptations are inherited meaning that the parents pass them on to the offspring. Or they can be developed depending on the kind of environment that that specific plant or animal is living in. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Animals and plants adapt to specific environments. Who can tell me what an environment is? An environment is a specific area where a plant or an animal is living at, like a habitat. So kind of like how beavers are only found in areas where there's water. That is their habitat or their environment. And all environments are part of an ecosystem. Who can tell me what an ecosystem is? An ecosystem is a community of living organisms interacting with the non-living parts of their environment. So the plants and animals interacting with the soil, with the water, with the air, with the rocks, all work together to make an ecosystem. Ecosystems have a continuous flow of energy that starts with the sun and recycles through the entire system. So the sun gives the energy to the plants so that they can make themselves food. Other animals eat those plants. Animals eat those animals. Then those animals die and those uh, nutrients and the energy gets put back into the soil to be used by the plants again in combination with the energy of the sun. So it's a giant network of living and non-living things all working together. That makes an ecosystem. Animals have adaptations to the environment in which they live. For example, where do prairie dogs live? On the prairie! So, they have adaptations to living on the prairie. And this is what the prairie looks like. And for most of the year, prairie grasses are not photosynthesizing. So they're not green. They're typically a brownish color. So what color is a prairie dog? Brown, yes. So, and that's so that they can camouflage 
with their environment. Camouflage is an adaptation. So what kinds of homes do prairie dogs live in? They live in burrows. So what kinds of tools do they need to make those homes? They need claws, yes. Claws allow them to dig their burrows and survive in their habitat. So what else do you know about prairie dogs? Why were they given the name dog? Because they bark. Yes, because they bark. And this bark that they um, do is an adaptation to working together. Prairie dogs live in colonies or in groups. And when you live in groups, it comes with a lot of advantages. One of them is more protection against predators. Adaptations can be physical, like how they're brown to match the environment, or they can be behavioral with, in this, in this example, with the bark. So prairie dogs actually have one of the most complex animal languages that has ever been studied. They can say what we say in a full sentence in a single bark. So when they let out a bark, they're saying, there's a red-tailed hawk coming from the south going this fast all in that one little bark. This is a behavioral adaptation to working together in groups to give them more protection. The shortgrass prairie is an ecosystem that gets very little rainfall per year, meaning that there isn't a whole lot of water around. So the plants and animals that live on the shortgrass prairie have to be adapted to being drought tolerant. Prairie dogs get all of the water that they need from the plants that they eat. You don't see them going down to a creek or a stream to drink water. They get it all from their diet, all from the plants that they consume. Prairie plants have really deep roots so that they can gather as much water as possible. Do you know how tall you are? Some prairie plants have roots that go down almost nine feet deep. I am five foot tall, so that is three feet more than I am tall. And here's a picture just to show you. Prairie plants also have really slender leaves, like grasses do. This helps them to lose less water to evaporation. Who can tell me what evaporation is? Yes, it's when the heat of the sun causes the water from a plant to turn into steam and leave the plant. So in order to lose less water to evaporation, prairie plants have these slender leaves. Trees on the shortgrass prairie have adapted to receiving very little water by only growing near larger bodies of water. So next to streams, creeks, um, maybe temporary ponds that you find on the shortgrass prairie. These areas where you find more water are called riparian ecosystems. And riparian is just a fancy word that says next to a large body of water, such as a river, a creek, or a stream. Today, I am at the Seenac Creek Nature Center at Aurora Reservoir. And Aurora Reservoir is a big man-made lake. This is where Aurora gets most of its drinking water. And when we put in this reservoir, we created a riparian ecosystem. You can see that there's several trees growing around the edges of the reservoir because now there's enough water for them to thrive. Whereas just over the hill, you're not going to find any trees because that's the natural short grass prairie that exists here in Aurora.
You find different plants and animals in riparian areas than you would find on the prairie because they are adapted to different conditions. What kinds of animals do you think that you would find in a riparian ecosystem? One animal that you can find in a riparian ecosystem is a beaver. So beavers have several adaptations to living under the water. And we're gonna talk about a few of them. But first off, what do beavers eat? They eat wood. Yes, so they have these special teeth that allow them to chop down pieces of wood and then their inside teeth, the molars, are adapted to chewing down that wood. So the front teeth for cutting it down, the inside teeth for consuming it. And these big old teeth they have grow all throughout their lifetime. Every time a beaver cuts down a tree, they grind down some of their teeth. So if their teeth didn't keep growing all throughout their lifetime, they would probably die after cutting down two or three trees. This is an adaptation. Their teeth continuously growing throughout their lifetime. Here I have a beaver pelt. Beavers have some really cool adaptations for living under the water. And one of them is that they have these special glands underneath their skin that produces an oil that covers all of their fur and makes them completely waterproof. So they'll be diving under the water and be completely dry. Super, super cool. They also have a third eyelid. So if any of you have cats, Maybe you've seen their third eyelid, but it closes to the side. So when beavers dive underwater, their third eyelid closes and it acts like goggles. The eyelid is see-through, it's transparent. So they can see everything that they need to while they're swimming underwater. They also have two membrane flaps. They're like a little flap that is in their ears and in their noses that close when they're diving underwater. That way they don't get any water coming into their ears or rushing into their nose. I really wish I had something like that. Another animal that you'll find in riparian ecosystems are ducks. And ducks have some unique adaptations for living in the water as well. Just like a beaver, they have some oils that cover their feathers that make them more or less waterproof. They also have webbed feet that help propel them through the water more efficiently. There are some animals that you can find in more than one kind of environment, like coyotes. You can find coyotes in riparian areas, you can also find them on the short grass prairie. You can even find them in urban environments like our neighborhoods. And coyotes have several adaptations that allow them to live in all kinds of environments. The first one is that they are generalists. They are omnivores, so they eat a whole variety of things. They are meat eaters, so they have these really sharp canine teeth for eating meat. They also eat plants. They'll eat cactus if they really need to. Um, and then they also forage for things that you and I probably would never eat, like, like trash. <laughs> but that makes them a generalist and also very opportunistic. And this allows them to adapt to all kinds of different environments. Here is 
a coyote pelt. And you can see that their colors uh, vary from darker shades to lighter shades. And this helps them camouflage in all kinds of different environments. So they can camouflage with the prairie, they can camouflage amongst a bunch of trees, and they can camouflage in our urban areas while they're uh, searching around for food at night. Another animal that you can find in several different types of environments is the red fox. So the red fox lives on the prairie, lives in wooded riparian areas, and we also see them in our urban areas as well. And they have some pretty neat adaptations. So this, do you think that this is camouflage? Camouflage colors? Yes, it certainly is. Absolutely. Foxes also have some pretty incredible hearing. They can hear a watch ticking from 120 feet away. Super crazy, but very cool. Foxes also have some really good night vision. Their pupils open up like a cat's at night so that they can uh, gather as much light as possible so that they can see better at night. They also live underground in dens for protection, and they can run up to 30 miles per hour. It's a fast little guy. Another animal that you can find here in Aurora is the skunk. And they have some pretty neat adaptations as well. So do you think that these are camouflage colors? No, these are not colors of camouflage. These are warning colors. Skunks have some musk glands on their rear end that produce a very nasty smelling substance. And they use this substance to scare off predators that might be trying to eat them. These glands can shoot that substance up to 12 feet away. So, you really don't want to get very close to a skunk. Um, skunks also live underground, like foxes do, in dens, and they are nocturnal, so they only come out at night. Here is a great horned owl. Probably my favorite animal. Great horned owls are the biggest owls that we have here in Aurora, and they're also the most common. They are apex predators. They are very, very powerful raptors. And birds of prey are typically called raptors. And they're called raptors because they are related to the dinosaur Velociraptor, believe it or not. So owls have some, some really cool adaptations. One of them is that they have some pretty incredible night vision, and vision in general. They can see better than we can during the day. So here is an owl skull, and they have some really, really big eyes. And you can see on the skull that the eyes are surrounded by this, this bony sheath. And that makes it so that they can't move their eyes up and down and side to side like we can. So instead, they have to move their heads to look around at different things instead of just moving their eyes. So, they can turn their heads almost all the way around. They can't make a full 360 degrees, so they can't make a full circle. They can go 270 degrees. So almost all the way around. Their eyesight is so good that they can see a itty bitty little mouse on the other side of a football field using only the light of a candle. Very cool. They also have 
have some pretty incredible hearing. Their ears are not on the same sides of their head like ours are. They have one ear that's a little higher than the other. And this helps them so that they can triangulate specifically where a sound is coming from. So if you've ever seen a video or you've had this, the pleasure of seeing an owl doing this move, it's because they are triangulating the sound. They're trying to figure out exactly where it's coming from and they will figure out exactly where it's coming from. They also fly in complete silence. They have these tiny little projections on the ends of their feathers. This is the owl wing, so in the front of the wing. They have these tiny little projections that break up the air as they're flying. And breaking up the air like that makes it so that they don't produce any sound as they're flying. You've probably heard a flock of geese fly by. Aside from their honking, you can typically hear their wings flapping. With an owl, it could fly right over your head and you would never hear it. So they have, this is an owl foot, they have some really powerful talons. Super, super sharp. Razor blade sharp. If an owl were to land on my arm, it would slice through my flesh like spreadable butter. Very, very powerful talons. They also have like a sandpaper-like foot so that when they grab onto prey, it gives, it gives them better grip. And their feet are covered in feathers. Most birds don't have any kind of feathers on their legs or on their feet. Owls do because it helps them fly in silence, but it also protects them from prey that are trying to escape their grasp. So let's say that the owl grabs onto a snake and the snake tries to come up and bite the owl on the foot. These feathers are going to protect the owl from being bitten by that snake. Us as human beings also have adaptations to the environment in which we live in. What kind of environment do you think that we live in? We live in urban communities. And what kind of adaptations do you think that we might have? Well, we have agriculture, farming, and ranching. So we have the ability to grow the plants that we eat and raise the animals that we eat. We also have technology. So we have things like transportation that allows us to move goods and services all over the world. We have the internet, which allows us to ask any question we might possibly have. And we have medicine. Illnesses and diseases that killed millions of people historically just a hundred years ago, we now have cures for. And we have physical adaptations as well. One of them is sweating, so we have the ability to regulate our body temperature. We also have teeth that are adapted for eating plants and meat. And we are bipedaled, meaning that we walk on two legs. So do you think if you were to be put in the middle of the forest, would you be able to survive? No, I don't think so because you are not adapted to living in the forest. You and I are adapted to living in urban communities. Thank you for joining me, Naturalist Fendi, on this nature video journey as we explored some of the ecosystems that we have here in Aurora and learned about the wildlife and some of their adaptations. 
Your next task is to answer the post video questions and do the activities. You may want to send your teacher the answers to your questions or you can send them to us, the naturalist team. We would love to hear from you. Our email addresses are in the description box below if you would like to send us a message or you want to send us the answers to your questions to be reviewed. We are so grateful that you joined us here today to learn a little bit about the wildlife that we find here in Aurora and their adaptations. We hope to see you in another video or in person once the nature centers open up again. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.